Hello and welcome to another episode of Amayo Meets. Uh, today I have with me the founder and chairman of APO. APO is like a press uh, agency, the do PR, uh, among other things. I've been publishing a lot of content from them and today I'm lucky to have the chairman himself. His name is quite difficult to get right, so I'm just going to call him Nicolas Mona. Nicolas Pompigne Mona. Mona. Yeah, I avoid the Pompigne, but I got the Mona. Ah, <laughs> yeah, that's, okay. that's, okay. that's good enough. Good, good. enough. Good. So, yeah. uh, talking about the APO, how did the concept, the idea come about? Well, I was a journalist uh, in France. I was representing Gabon News, which is a press agency based in Gabon. Uh, I was a correspondent in Europe. And, uh, you know, it was in uh, 2007, at that, same, at that time, uh, the narrative about Africa was, uh, you know, uh, uh, quite poor. It was uh, the time of uh, that front page of uh, The Economist, Africa, the hopeless continent, etc. So uh, all the media coverage produced by the international media was about uh, poverty, um, you know, AIDS, uh, conflicts, etc. But I knew, as a journalist of uh, uh, an African media in Europe, I knew that there were already good news about the continent. I knew that... Uh, African Development Bank already produced reports about the emerging uh, middle class on the continent and, uh, and obviously Africa is not a country. Uh, you may have a conflict here and there, but uh, uh, you don't have uh, 54 conflicts in 54, etc. And so, mm -hmm. so there, there were good news about the continent, but the international media um, probably did not have access to uh, mm -hmm. those, uh, those news. So what I decided to do is to uh, contact all the international institutions, uh, African international institutions, uh, Pan-African institutions. So, uh, from African Development Bank to African Union Commission to Pan African Parliament, etc. I gather their press releases, make sure I subscribe and I receive all their press releases. Some will send me the press release in a PDF format, some in a Word format, some by email, whatever. I will uh, standardize all of this in a news ML format, which is the uh, standard uh, format for news exchange across the world. And then I went to Bloomberg, I went to Reuters, I went to uh, news aggregators like LexisNexis, uh, Dojo and Factiva, and I proposed them the content uh, for free. I said, listen, uh, uh, please uh, uh, give that content, make that content available to uh, international media uh, with the hope that it will help rebalance the narrative. They will see that uh, at least they will not be able to ignore that uh, there is also, there are also good news uh, about the continent. And now we, 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 we did that for, uh, for uh, well, 16 years now. Mm -hmm. And along the years, uh, APO became uh, uh, the leading uh, Pan-African communication consultancy and press release distribution service. So we are doing two things, press release distribution, we are sending uh, to a um, lot of media, we have a media list of uh, 450,000 contacts of uh, journalists in Africa or reporting on Africa. We are sending text, image, videos, uh, audio files also for radios, video for TVs, uh, um, about uh, all sorts of uh, activities on the continent from, from sport to uh, uh, hospitality industry, logistics, we have 325 clients. So that's a press release distribution activity mm -hmm. and we also have a public relation activity. So we are the public relation agency for the entire continent of Africa, for uh, FIFA, for uh, Canon, uh, for uh, Jack Ma Foundation. Uh, we are working with uh, Nestle, uh, the African Development Bank, etc., etc. So Canon. Yes, exactly. Well, I, I, I know I know you are using I, I, I know you are using Canon here. Congratulations on this. Those are the, the good cameras to you. Yeah. Fantastic. I mean, you make it sound very easy, but I'm guessing when you were starting it, there were some challenges. What were some of the challenges you had to go to? Well, plenty. You know, uh, I started. Uh, I started on my own from uh, not not from my garage, but from my living room. You know, uh, so uh, so it's a, it's a journey uh, as an entrepreneur. You know, uh, so the the challenges were, were numerous. You know, I'm giving uh, lectures when I'm traveling across Africa. I'm going to uh, uh, business schools and uh, and uh, journalism communication school, and I have. Uh, uh, some tips I'm sharing with uh, with the students about uh, how to become an entrepreneur, specifically how a journalist can become an entrepreneur. Um, well, it would be difficult to summarize uh, a 16 oh, years uh, journey, but uh, but when it comes to challenges, I mean, uh, you have plenty. Uh, what I can tell you is, uh, um, what I find is that uh, most people, usually a huge minority of, uh, of people, do not understand or appreciate what it takes uh, to uh, to create a company mm -hmm. uh, and to develop a company, anyone can create a company, right? You can register and incorporate your company, etc. But develop a company is is, is another is another thing, you know. Uh, moving from uh, uh, from one person to five person mm -hmm. to ten person to fifty person to hundred person to two hundred person 
from one client to five clients to ten clients to fifty clients to hundred clients to three hundred clients. It's another story entirely. It takes uh, takes a lot of time, takes a lot of drive. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, a roller coaster, as you would say uh, mm -hmm. in English. Uh, so you have uh, all sorts of problems, all sorts of troubles, uh, finance, uh, uh, talents management, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's uh, it's very difficult, but when you have a drive, when you have uh, you know uh, the will uh, to do it, um, well, it's, it's physical. Good. And in terms of the makeup, uh, how big is the team and uh, distribution? Which countries are they in? Where are you headquartered and all of that? So we, choose, we, we used to have our headquarters in Senegal, uh, and back in 2012, I think we moved our headquarters to Lausanne in Switzerland. And the reason was that, uh, you know, um, Africa is uh, uh, such that uh, if you have your headquarters in uh, Gabon, people will say you are a bongo man. If mm -hmm. you are headquarters in Rwanda, mm -hmm. people will say, well, you belong to Kagame, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. So as you know, uh, Switzerland is neutral. <laughs> uh, so we went to Switzerland. So uh, uh, I haven't heard uh, for a while now, a decade, <laughs> that I belong to someone or whatever, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, we are not. We have no close tie with any governments. We are working with some governments, but we are not. Uh, I mean, I own 100% of the company. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, 10, 15 years ago, it was uh, it was uh, um, um, very easy to imagine that uh, uh, you know uh, part of the shareholding was that president or that president, etc. So uh, we went to uh, Lausanne in, in Switzerland, uh, where uh, we have the uh, the headquarters. But we have team uh, scattered across Africa. We basically are. We have presence where our clients are. Uh, so we, we have present in, in Ghana, uh, in uh, so not in each 54 countries because our, our clients are not That's operating in place. in all the countries. Um, even if uh, along the 15 last 15 years we have provided services in all the countries, including Eritrea, Somaliland, etc., for our clients. So we are projecting staff when needed. We are sending staff when needed. Um, so there is not one country where we haven't uh, organized an interview, published uh, an opinion piece, organizing a press conference, etc., etc. Uh, but when it's come to full-time job, uh, full-time talents, uh, we have, uh, I think, uh, 15 or 18 countries. So I'm talking Egypt, Morocco, Senegal, uh, Ghana, Ivory Coast, uh, South Africa, uh, Kenya, Zimbabwe. Uh, it's good for memory. <laughs> good for memory. Uh, Ethiopia, Uganda. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm forgetting Zambia. Zambia. Uh, I'm forgetting a few. I'm, I'm forgetting a few for sure. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. And one thing that seems to be like your specialty uh, in recent times will be sports. Uh, I see you covering sports a lot. So mm -hmm. uh, why that? And take us through that journey. Also. Well, the first thing I can tell you about that is um, um, it may be the most visible of our activities, mm -hmm. but in fact, that's not the core business. Um, as I said earlier, we have, th we have 325 clients. Uh, we, we served 325 clients last year, 2022. Uh, and uh, most of them, like a huge majority of them, 85, 90% are multinational uh, corporations active in Africa. So our main business, our core business, will be uh, uh, clients like Canon or Nestle or, or uh, you know, uh, Coca-Cola, uh, DHL, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Uh, also international institutions. And so um, uh, in 2017, uh, I decided that uh, you know it's uh, doing um, business and money is one thing, but you know at some point you want to uh, um, bring give back and do something positive, etc. So I got in touch with um, uh, Rugby Africa, which is a governing body of rugby in Africa. I played rugby myself uh, long ago, days. long ago <laughs> when I, I used to have hair, you know. And um, and uh, and so I uh, discussed with them, and um, they didn't uh, had a budget at the time. I said, listen, we'll uh, we we'll provide public relation to for for Rugby Africa for free. And so we became uh, uh, their official partner in terms of rugby collision. And, uh, and that's how uh, slowly we, we basically discovered that uh, as, a, as a very famous, uh, famous and prominent Ghanaian keeps saying all over, uh, uh, sport is a business. Mm -hmm. I'm referring mm -hmm. to uh, Herbert Mensah, Mensah, which has been appointed uh, president of Rugby Africa. Mm -hmm. He was on a Bloomberg event uh, in Morocco recently and he keep uh, uh, hammering, seeing everywhere that sport is a big business and rugby is a big business. That's a fact. Uh, you see, after we uh, we uh, um, uh, entered that partnership with Rugby Africa, we became the Pan African Public Relations Agency of NBA. Mm -hmm. um, let's not forget NBA is a corporation; it's not a sport federation. Uh, then we became the Pan African Public Relations of uh, the Basketball Africa League. Then FIFA. Uh, so we uh, we are since uh, 2020, I think. Uh, the uh, Pan-African Public Relations Agency of FIFA. 
Uh, we entered also a partnership with uh, Olympique de Marseille, uh, the French uh, football club, uh, and now uh, deeply involved with Rugby Africa. Uh, President Mensa just appointed me um, a special advisor to the President of Rugby Africa. So we are helping developing uh, African, African rugby. I mean, let's zoom into rugby. I mean, it's not a very typical uh, African sport. So uh, what have you identified as a potential that is letting you put your energies towards it? Well, uh, there are a few things which come to mind, three in fact. Um, first of all, uh, as you may know, uh, the current champion of the world of rugby is South Africa. And last time I checked, South Africa is in Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, and South Africa is three-time uh, champion of the world. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is you may not know that, but uh, in 2022, there were six countries playing rugby in Africa. Today, there are 37. Um, and then there is another thing which people tend to uh, not to um, realize is that um, you probably heard about the uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, uh, which are basically uh, driving uh, the, uh, the uh, strategy and vision of so many organizations, countries, etc. I was uh, uh, visiting an official uh, uh, building uh, here in Ghana not that long ago in the, in the waiting room. Uh, you had a United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, etc. So it just happened that one of the goals, uh, goals are inclusivity and, uh, and diversity and those kind of things. Well, there is no sport more inclusive and more welcoming of diversity than rugby, when you think about it. So um, I'm asking everyone here to do the math. Look at, a, uh, let's say, a woman team of uh, football mm -hmm. um, anywhere in the world. You look at the tallest player and the shortest player and the uh, uh, lightest player and the heaviest player. Mm -hmm. The difference will be 5 centimeters and, and 15 kilos between the shortest and lighter players and the tallest and heaviest player. Now you take the rugby team, woman rugby team, and you look at the difference between the shortest player and the tallest player. The difference would be huge. Mm -hmm. The difference may be as, as much as 15, 20 centimeters. And the weight also will be huge. We could have a, a player which is 70 kilos and one which is 120 or whatever. So uh, you see in rugby, um, I don't know when is the last time you look at a, at a game. <laughs> Hopefully you can look at uh, South Africa during mm -hmm. the World Cup. Uh, but you know that uh, uh, you need different type of players mm -hmm. uh, with different morphologies. Mm -hmm. So when you transpose that to uh, uh, you know, uh, diversity and, and inclusivity yes. and gender, etc. Uh, well, uh, a woman which will be... Uh, you know, um, not necessarily uh, matching, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the the trend on Twitter or so on Instagram, etc., mm -hmm. etc. You know, uh, well, uh, because maybe she's uh, or considered as overweighted, or she's like considered as like uh, too tall or too strong, etc. On the field of rugby, in a team of rugby, that woman will be valued. She will be celebrated. Our strengths, our, our power, will be uh, put to good use. Uh, she will be proud of being part of the team. She'll have a part to play in that thing. Uh, rugby needs uh, tall, strong, small, uh, fast, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, big, uh, small, and uh, powerful, uh, all sorts of, uh, uh, of, uh, of morphology and, and typology, etc. And, um, well, if you know another sport uh, which is so welcoming of such a diversity of uh, morphology, you tell me, but I, I don't think there are any. It's a bit difficult to think to <laughs> about one, I as you know. put it. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. True. And are <clears> you doing something specifically in terms of rugby <clears throat> in Ghana that brings you here this time? Well, I met here to, uh, to visit a few people, <coughs> a few officials, uh, but also obviously I had several meetings with uh, the president of Ruby Africa, Herbert Menza. As I told you, uh, uh, he appointed me, uh, he made me the honor to appoint me as a special advisor. And uh, so we have several uh, meetings uh, to discuss about uh, current affair of uh, African rugby. Um, yeah, so that's one of the reasons why I'm here. Fantastic. <coughs> um, in the bigger scheme of things, has there been one client you've wanted that you haven't gotten and you want to get still? Uh, there is one. <laughs> there is one. There is one. You know what? I, you know, we, we, have, um, we have FIFA. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, uh, we have uh, the Vatican, so the Catholic Church, okay. uh, SECAM, which is headquartered here. Um, I'm mentioning those two because it's as big as it gets, really. <laughs> uh, but there is one which is on my radar, which I, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I want to have OPEC. Uh, I want to have OPEC. That's uh, big, big. They, they are my, they are, they are my radar. I'm, uh, you know, sometime between you, the decision you are making to say, I want to have that one, and the, the moment you actually have them, it can take like uh, one year, two years, three years, mm -hmm. whatever, you know? So I'm, that's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I'm, yeah. I, I already 
I'm the king. I'm moving way. my, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, uh, I'll do it. But some need to have some objectives, you know. So uh, one need to have some objectives. So, yeah. mm -hmm. Those are my objectives. Yeah. Fantastic. <coughs> so looking forward into the future, what should uh, the media space, Africa, uh, expect <coughs> from APU uh, going forward? Well, Africa and the media space, I think, listen, it, I think it all comes down to the figures uh, published by the United Nations about the demography of the continent. By 2100, Africa will be 40% of all humanity. And I mean, um, it seems to me that uh, uh, a lot of discussion should start with that statement, uh, that reminder to uh, uh, that, uh, um, because it dictates so many strategies of sport governing bodies, uh, global governing bodies or uh, multinational uh, companies, etc., etc. It is clear that uh, um, I'm old enough to have seen uh, uh, again that front page from the Economist: Africa is the hopeless continent. Mm -hmm. There is, it's not, it's not a market. It's not. There is nothing there. It's just, it's hopeless, right? As, mm -hmm. uh, um, so there is nothing to expect. There is no future uh, for the continent. Uh, I saw uh, uh, China. So China now is a new El Dorado and. Uh, all the multinational will, uh, you know, make so much money in China and etc. It was like not that long ago, huh? uh, and uh, we had the Africa rising, uh, etc. But, but now, uh, uh, no one can, uh, no one can ignore. No multinational company, no international sports federation can ignore the demographics. And the demographics again is that, according to the UN, by 2100, Africa will be 40 percent of all humanity. And those are people to be born mm -hmm. uh, in the in the coming uh, in the coming uh, decades. So they will be young, young, you know. Uh, so um, <clears throat> I mean, uh, there is that figure about Nigeria, which is uh, on the verge in a couple of uh, decades or whatever to have more uh, uh, inhabitants than the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, so um, Africa has a huge potential. Everyone knows that. Uh, I've seen the corporations. Uh, uh, investing on the African continent, understand that they cannot. Uh, that's that's where they're going to make money. That's where they're going to make margin. And and even if, <clears throat> even if uh, entering the market is difficult, uh, even if uh, uh, they are not making a uh, lot of money at the beginning, mm -hmm. they know that they, they cannot afford not to be on that market for the next decade, the next twenty years, the next fifty years, etc. Mm -hmm. And again, <clears throat> after the multinational uh, com company, you have now the sport federation, which mm -hmm. understand that. For so many reasons, including the morphotype, the mm -hmm. type of uh, uh, again, as I said, Africa is not a country, and so you have uh, you have type of bodies on the African continent which are uh, tailor made for uh, running, uh, jumping, uh, pushing, uh, whatever, whatever, right? And I mean, when it's come to rugby, uh, you have uh, I mean, the, the president of uh, uh, Rugby Africa, Albert Mensah, was meeting the president of the French Rugby Federation uh, a few weeks ago, and we learned during the meeting that uh, there are no less than 1,200 Africans playing rugby in France. 1,200. So I guess the idea is uh, just like uh, the Basketball Africa League, just like uh, any, a lot of other uh, sport, uh, sport uh, federations, sport uh, bodies, governing bodies, the idea is to create competition in Africa, so African athletes can stay in Africa, make a living in Africa. Uh, so it's uh, about the creation of an entire ecosystem, uh, which is uh, you know, uh, in the making, uh, we are not there yet. There is a lot of efforts to be uh, to be put. The governments need to play their part in, in that effort. Uh, we need infrastructures. Uh, we need support. Uh, you know, um, we are talking about, uh, for instance, uh, <coughs> the fact that the governing body of rugby in the world, world rugby, uh, while giving uh, five million a year to uh, uh, France, uh, to uh, five million to Ireland, five million to uh, uh, to UK, etc., is giving only two million. Uh, for the entire for the entire continent of Africa, and that 37 countries playing rugby. Uh, so, uh, if you do the math, uh, France will receive five million, and uh, Kenya will receive uh, 25,000. Mm -hmm. How exactly are we supposed to uh, to uh, uh, you know invest in the game, develop the game, make sure the athletes have the proper nutrition, infrastructure, coach, etc., etc. Plus, uh, there are things uh, people do not seem to. Uh, Realize, uh, okay, so the, when the French team is playing against the I Irish team in Ireland, they take flights, the flight will cost maybe, I don't know, $200 or whatever, right? And there is no, and there are no visa costs. Mm -hmm. Well, if Ghana is playing against Mauritius, they need to go through Dubai, the cost is like uh, crazy, mm -hmm. and they need to pay a visa. So who needs, who needs the most support here? Mm -hmm. And is it fair? Is it fair? Is it, is it fair? So 
there are a lot to, uh, to, uh, to be done to change the mindset. Those are the words, those are not even my words, those are the words of uh, Herbert Mensah, the president of uh, Ruby Africa. There's a lot to be done to change the mindset of the, govern the governing bodies, uh, including World Rugby, uh, and, uh, but also the governments. The governments need to support whatever they are. Um, you know, sports is, has been identified long ago as a, as a, a tool for development. It's good for uh, education, health, conflict resolution, peace, etc., etc. When you when the youth is playing sport, uh, it's, it's good for so many things. Mm -hmm. But you need infrastructure. Uh, you need proper nutrition. Uh, you need proper uh, coach. Uh, you need you need opportunities. Um, only uh, I think six months ago. Uh, I don't think it's still the case. But six months ago, I think. The three champions of the world of MMA were Africans, yeah. African citizens, not from African descent, African mm -hmm. citizens. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the, uh, the Rugby World Cup, which is starting in a few weeks in Paris, uh, in the French team you have, out of 15 players, you have maybe five, six which are from African descent, one way or the other. In the UK team, it's basically the same. Mm -hmm. Let's not even talk about the NBA. Mm -hmm. So, uh, is, it, is it fair? Thank you very much, Nicholas, and uh, thank you for tuning in. Make sure you hit the subscribe button and come back for more exciting interviews. Bye-bye.